very much, everyone, for coming. Um, I'd like to welcome Katia, Venezuela <coughs> from uh, Chile, who's uh, visiting us at Middlesex University. Um, it's also, this uh, seminar is co-hosted with a number of us here, at, uh, first of all from the Centre for Enterprise and Economic Development Research, um, and with, uh, through uh, that we have a programme of exchange called the INCASI programme, looking at supporting uh, research on inequalities, particularly linking uh, Latin America and uh, UK and Spain. Um, and so Katia is part of that exchange uh, programme, so you're very welcome to hear from that. This is also part of the Sustainable Development Research Cluster at Middlesex University. Uh, so one of the, the group, groupings of academics across the university looking at sustainable development research. And it's also part of the uh, Centre for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity, uh, which is another uh, in, uh, inter-university programme led by University of Surrey, looking at what does prosperity mean, what are the challenges we're facing in reaching an alternative way of having prosperity that's all about living well within our limits. And that's where this uh, talk today is very much related to this work we're doing within this programme called CUSP, the Centre for Understanding Sustainable Prosperity. And that is um, uh, very much looking at this idea of when we're there. So we're looking forward very much to looking at that because within CUSP we're really interested in looking at what is the meaning of the good life. How can we live well and uh, reach uh, our sustainability, uh, you know, address the sustainability challenges we're, we're having as well? So, without any more, I'd like to pass over. There'll be time for a good discussion afterwards as well. Uh, we are being recorded, so if anybody wants me to turn the camera off uh, for their questions or anything, let me know. But otherwise, it might be put out uh, in a more public environment as well. And we're joined as well by Brian Doherty at uh, University of Kiel, who's very interested in this part of our CUSP programme. But he's doing work on uh, environmental activists uh, in the UK. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Um, it's a very nice way to say goodbye to London because I'm leaving tomorrow back to Chile. I need to work there. So and I have a lot tons of teaching waiting for me. So good. It was a good month. I spent one month here at Middlesex University. Um, as Fern said, by the by Nkasi, the Nkasi network and by uh, I forgot the way how the center is pronounced. Caesar? <laughs> good. <laughs> um, and yeah, it was a very good way to put myself into writing, which is pretty much what we lack as academics. So, and this is um, an attempt to summarize what I've been writing for a paper to be published, hopefully soon. I don't know when, but uh, that's, the, that's the hope. So uh, just to give a brief idea of what I will be talking about for the next half an hour or so, um, what I'm what I'm writing about right now is part of my of my research the research I'm doing now about uh, environmental inequalities in Chile and more more specifically about social movements uh, environmental movements which there's something very interesting to say at the very beginning they don't call themselves environmental movements okay so the idea of environmentalism is an, uh, is very much aligned with the, with the experiences of the global north, of uh, the west, but not necessarily Latin America. So in the case of Chile, at least, we are talking about the defense of territories. So that's a, an, an interesting difference between the, the context. So um, this research, what it seeks is explore the views and practices developed by grassroots movements to resist environmental injustice and the proliferation of sacrifice zone in their territories and to discuss the alternatives to capitalist development that these movements are envisioning and or enacting because some of them are pretty much thinking about it and whereas some other uh, experiences are trying to uh, put forward some concrete experiences, ideas and take, put that into practice. Um, so the, my research is broader. The, the, I have a, I got a three years grant for researching this, so I'm, I'm looking at all more cases across the, the country, specifically central 
south uh, of the country. Um, you know, Chile, well, I'll show you later, Chile is a very long country, so we will definitely see um, different experiences in conflicts uh, all the way the country. Um, I'm looking particularly at Central South uh, environmental conflicts. And, but for this presentation, for the paper I'm writing, I will be focusing on four coastal cities of Central and South, Southern Chile. I will show you later where they are. Uh, but I didn't want to start before putting this into perspective, and especially because right now this is like a very popular topic, you know. So we have Greta uh, in the media everywhere, we have Extinction Rebellion in the UK now preparing their big rebellion, I think next week. I'm gonna miss it. But, um, so all these uh, climate justice movements are pretty much in the media and the discussion and, and trying to, to push governments and corporations to, to make changes. Um, this, uh, on the one hand we have the West, uh, and on the other hand we have, uh, just put some big random pictures of Latin America, because I think what's very important to, um, to be clear of is that the struggles in Latin America about um, the defense of territories, as the movements call it, it's a long-lasting struggle. This is not happening now, this is not happening in the 2000s, this is happening from centuries ago since pretty much the colonization, conquest of the Americas. So, um, I think that's very important to, to, to put in context when I will start talking about uh, environmental struggles. Um, but today, it's a very, it's a, we are facing this very interesting moment where all these struggles somehow are starting to talk to each other and to see each other and it's like the moment of the, of the global crisis, you know? So now all these people are there and are, and are trying to uh, bring a message. Um, and that's why, of course, researching um, all these conflicts is so relevant today. If we look at this, is a map, uh, it's a very interesting web page. It's called Atlas of, of Environmental Justice, and it's a participatory uh, web page where basically you can, if you have enough information, you can uh, update all the conflicts across the world, environmental conflicts. Um, and it's made by scholars and also uh, activists. So it's a good way to see what's going on today, that, that's uh, the updated version of 2019. And if, you, if I try to go closer to the cases I've been uh, researching uh, in Chile, uh, this is a very conservative um, map of environmental conflicts that, that's updated in uh, 2018. So it shows 116 social, social environmental conflicts in Chile. So all across the country, and I say conservative because the the conflicts that they define and identify here, um, for example, I added way more than what they have. So basically, I think it should go to 200, 300 conflicts, active conflicts today in my country. Um, so within this context, I will be talking to you about these four cases. This, these are the cities, these are the names of the cities, um, and well, the, that, that's the map, right? And so this is the case of the central Chile, Valparaiso region, Quintero, Cuchuncaví, those are the names of the cities affected, and this is the, these are the cases of Bio Bio region. I live here, so I've been doing most, most of my research there because I've been working with um, active uh, participatory action research, ethnography, so of course, because I'm based there, it's much easier to research there. And because my region is full of extractive projects everywhere, basically, so it's also easy to research this. Um, so these are photos of these four areas, as you can tell. Well, these are four coastal cities, um, surrounded by dozens of industries, each of, each of them, um, and different also a type of industries. I'll, I'll show you that there now. So in the case of uh, Wuhan, for example, one of the cities, those are the main um, uh, projects, um, corporate projects and some of them state projects actually. Um, if uh, the oil refinery company, it's a state-owned uh, company. 
uh, waste uh, water treatment plant, chemical industries, and in the case of Huelpen, there's this threat of a real estate project, which is, which one basically it's uh, they're gonna build these uh, upper class uh, houses in the the only I would call green lung that it's uh, left in this area. So that's another like um, um, part of this uh, what they call dispossession. Uh, but the movement is called dispossession from their territories. Um, in the case of Talcahuano, the other city I've been working with, um, they are very strong in, in the sector of fishing industry. Uh, it's also an industrial port. Uh, it has a, a very also important, uh, initially state-owned, but now private, steel plant, batching plants, and also the, the threat of two gas terminals in this um, in this city, which is, um, that's uh, Talcahuano, this is a photo of Walpen, that's the oil refinery uh, industry, very, very close to the neighborhood, so they, there is no really, it's so just like the houses start here and the, I don't know, and the, and the industry starts just like a few meters there, it's just really a street separating the neighborhood from the, from the plant. Um, and these two other, um, Cities I've been working with, Quintero Puchuncaví, they also very similar, uh, both, and all of them really are very similar in terms of the industries that they are, um, uh, that are located in these cities. Oil refinery company, copper smelter industry, industrial ports, thermoelectric plants, gas terminal in the case of Quintero Puchuncaví, in the case of Coronel, fishing industry again, similar to Talcahuano, industrial port as well, thermoelectric plants, surrounded by forestry and batching concrete plants. It's interesting here that in these two cases, these have been officially recognized by the Chilean government as sacrifice zones. That's a concept that um, it was pushed by the, um, by the mayors, by the city council mayors from these um, uh, cities because they, they, they wanted the government to, to bring special additional funding to deal with environmental consequences of all these kind of very, very strong and heavy, uh, heavily polluted cities. And the government at the end took it, um, which doesn't mean much in terms of, um, of concrete actions, um, but it's, a, it's an acknowledgement that the, of, the, of the situation, of the, of the levels of pollution that these cities uh, and the people living in the cities have to face every day. So, um, in, I'm particularly interested in the resistance. So this is the context I find very important to say. So this is what we are facing, this is what, this is what we are we're dealing with, but I'm interested in looking at what is people doing about this. Are they just submissively accepting this pollution um, or, or the threat of new projects coming into the cities uh, or not? And, so I'm working with uh, movements. Uh, so it's also interesting like, to clarify what I'm understanding by movements because uh, the experiences of resistance in these cases, they don't see as like large social movements as we will maybe understand. Um, they are more like micro um, collectives, groups, organizations that get together and uh, do activism but, uh, but at the same time they are super uh, connected to local communities and they do share work together so the ways they are organized is quite um, um, of course it varies, it's different from the different cases but um, pretty much those are the, the the groups I've been working with. Um, in the case of uh, Concepcion, because I'm working with, as I said, with participatory action research, I have a much closer relationship to them. I've been doing ethnography and also uh, as part of this participatory action research, we've been doing workshops together, trying to also bring the university and the communities together. And, and in that way, I, I have an epistemology that I don't, I'm, I, I don't put myself outside of the situation. I embrace my my commitment to the movement. So that's something I think also important to say. And in the case of Quintero Puchuncaví, as it's quite far from where I live, I had to travel and I conducted a more traditional approach to research there. It's very much uh, uh, group interviews and individual interviews and 
yeah, conversation, some form of conversation with the athletes there. Um, right. So uh, before of sharing with you some of the findings, preliminary findings, uh, findings because I haven't finished my research yet, uh, I also consider it important to to give you some some brief ideas about what's the context in Chile, um, the development model in Chile, because also we, as as Ferris mentioned, we want to do this um, this um, move this discussion forward to the idea of one vivir of a, an alternative to development, supposedly. So, I don't know how familiar you are with Chile and with the with Chilean history. Uh, we had a dictatorship for almost 30 years, from the 73 to the 90s. So, and with the dictator, uh, Augusto Pinochet, the, everything changed in Chile and a neoliberal uh, model system was was uh, installed and very much um, um, a leader in very much a leader in, in terms of neoliberalism in Chile uh, along with the UK as well which followed and so it's like the experiment of neoliberalism in the world of Chile <coughs> so and they've been doing well very well they're doing great Okay, so we have today a neoliberal, extractive and export-oriented model of development, of economy as well. Um, and this uh, is um, it's not necessarily that different from other countries or Latin America, which we could, we could say, well, there are countries, um, like progressive countries in Latin America, all the rise of the, the think type, you know. Um, we have our fellows here from Argentina, also an ex experience. Um, a different, totally different experience uh, in, in terms of the governments um, that have been ruling the countries. But, but what's interesting, and actually an Argentinian scholar, she calls this, Maristela Zwampa, the consensus of commodities. So basically, uh, the, from the Washington consensus to the, co to the commodities consensus, because despite the difference, I mean, the, the nuances between the, the governments from, le I mean, progressive, left wing, center to right wing, there is a consensus that the extractivism, neo-extractivist strategy is going to be the one um, for Latin America. I think, I, not only I think, scholars should think as well, that it's part of geopolitics. So Latin America has a role and still it continues having a role uh, in the dimensions and power of the world and the, and the role is still the extraction of raw materials and getting as much as possible, as fast as possible. So if I see this from a more kind of theoretical angle, I will totally agree from a Marx, with a Marxian perspective. So if this is pretty much the strategy of capitalism to continue this process of accumulation. Um, so this is, the, this is the model. This is the model uh, we, are, we have, uh, we are dealing with. Uh, and that comes with the institution, institution, with the legislation. So in the case of Chile, the environmental legislation has been made uh, in a way that fits the neoliberal uh, model of development. So therefore you need to give, you need to provide freedom to the enterprises, to business, to corporations. Uh, the state needs to remain um, minimum. So the, the, the system lacks of uh, regulatory um, capacities, so it's very, very unlikely that the state is able to, to prevent a project to, to happen. Um, so, um, unfortunately, I don't have time to get into details with this, but I think that's also important to say. So, basically, the, the, the environmental legislation and institutions in Chile uh, are very weak to prevent corporate and new extractive projects to to, to start. And now then I want to move to the findings of, of my research and, and about, well, just go back to my original questions that I have for this paper, like uh, the view, exploring the views and practices that these grassroots movements that resist extractivism, that resist uh, the imposition of these projects, what, what are they thinking, uh, what is their, their 
I wouldn't use the word ideology, what are their views about what they are um, going through in their territories. And the first thing that I think is important to mention is that at the first level of, of the, the movement's positioning, I would say, is what I, I call the politics <coughs> of refusal. So um, we, we are angry. We resist this. We don't like this. We don't like the, the, what we are seeing in our territories. We refuse capitalism, and that's very clear and visible. So it's a word that is uh, used, actually. So uh, the movements are clearly standing against capitalism, and in its way, it's shaped in the in this context, in its extractive and colonial version. Okay, so there's a clear understanding that capitalism is not just an abstract thing, but it's also connected to the way the model of development that they are seeing. Devastating their territories, by the way. Um, but they are also against the state. This is also very interesting because if we compare movements, um, I mean the other other type typologies of movements. This is a discussion that's been going on in the sociology of uh, uh, of social movements, uh, social movements and studies. Usually you have this idea of the, that the movements have a contentious relationship to the state. So basically the, the, you address these issues to the state in order to the state to solve these issues or have a say in these issues. Um, these movements, they have a very, I would say, um, interesting and contradictory relationship to the state. Because on the one hand, they also have a contentious relationship with it. Because in a way, for example, in order to, to Make, um, to prevent a project to, to start, for example, the gas terminals in Talcahuano, they have been going through all the legal procedures to make, it slow, to make the process slower. But at the end, they, they, they say, we don't trust the state. The state is going to pass this project anyway. So, but we, we do it anyway because we make the process slower and we try to stop it. But, we, but our hopes are not there. We don't, we're not hoping that by changing the government, things are going to get better and we're suddenly going to be out of extractivism. Um, of course, there are nuances. There are some groups that are more connected to some progressive uh, left-wing parties, but it's uh, not uh, the, the, the trend. The trend is very much uh, more inclined towards more autonomous groups, which are very suspicious, actually, of party politics. And, and that's what going on, at least with the cases I've been studying. Um, and interestingly, a third refusal is the refusal of patriarchy, which is something that wasn't there, I would say, a decade ago, in the, in the discourses of movements, of social movements in Chile, um, but because of the, the strong influence of feminism, again, correlating and with my Argentinian fellows, uh, the, the big wave of feminism in Argentina somehow affected, moved, had a transnational impact and affected Chile and feminism got very strong um, roots in Chile right now and it's influencing these movements as well, environmental movements or territory defense movements. And and of course, that's a very tricky territory as well, because on the one hand, there is a clear discourse against patriarchy, but on the other hand, there are a, a number of uh, micro-level practices that keep reproducing patriarchy inside organizations. So that's, uh, I think that would be also a topic for just one paper, really. Um, so all of these um, struggles uh, are also refusing injustice at a whole level. So we're going to talk about environmental injustices, we're really talking about injustice at all levels. Um, and well, that's a, so some pictures showing uh, the, the first one, the, this one. Uh, it's about the refusal of the state very much because that's a local, the city council uh, making the, the the tools for planning for the cities uh, is almost like saying, okay, so these uh, real estate projects want to uh, have their investment here, so we're going to make changes in the, in the planning, in the map of the city, so they can actually go and, and build their project here. 
So they are going to these uh, public uh, spaces where they are allowed to be. And, and of course, there is a direct action in terms of uh, challenging the, the politicians, and it usually ends in poli with the police in, the, in between, and so on. And that's also very interesting because this is um, mm -hmm. uh, it says uh, uh, neither uh, land nor women are territory to be conquered. So pretty much, it's like this uh, this union between uh, women and the defense of women's rights and the defense of the land mm -hmm. of nature. So it's also an idea that is getting a lot of attention now uh, in Chile. Um, this is, uh, shows a bit of the pollution that Quintero Buchuncaví, that, that area, has had in the last years. Actually, last year, just last year, there was a big, big crisis, pollution crisis, with uh, hundreds <coughs> of kids in the hospitals being um, uh, poisoned by heavy metals and acid rain and many other things that the, the, it's uh, they haven't really said about what was the magnitude of the, of the event. Um, this is a, a photo of this uh, green lung I mentioned to you in this other city that they want to basically build houses all around here and, and that will end in the privatization of the area so people will, will be unable to go and go to the nature and go to these natural places that have belong to them, they have this sense of identity of this this is also a case uh, that is in process. They are, they, it hasn't been approved yet, but it's like a salmon plant uh, to be installed in a place which is uh, uh, traditional belonging to fishermen. So it's also, of course, cha changing completely the dynamic, the internal dynamic the, of, the, of the area. Um, so the refusal is also uh, of criminalization and violence against social movements. I, I don't know if you've read, but in the Latin America has been um, acknowledged as the region with more murderers uh, of, um, of environmental activists in, in last year. So it's also very um, interesting because when there's been a whole debate about the uh, climate justice movements and, and how it, they are gaining, getting very popular now. Uh, in the case of Latin America, you have the risk of, ki of being killed, basically, if you, if you decide to, to fight uh, some of these corporate projects. In the case of Chile, we have uh, three activists being killed in the last uh, five, four years. Two of them allegedly uh, committed suicide. In the case of one of them, it's been proved by two independent, uh, I don't know how to say, forensic. Uh, forensics, 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 yeah, um, saying that uh, that theory is not really plausible because it's, it's, it's very clear that the person was uh, hanged after she was uh, dead, basically, when she was killed. Um, so, so this is also part of, of course, of the refusal and all the, of the risks of, of getting involved into this type of, of politics and of uh, struggles. But the refusal is not enough. So that's what I was saying is this is the first level. Along with the refusal, there is the, what, what I call the politics of creation and hope. So on the one hand, we're very clear that we, we reject these structures of oppression. Um, but on the other hand, we, we want to, to enact this other way of understanding life, this other way of understanding politics. So it's very, it's very common that they say, we're not environmentalists. We defend the territory. Because we're, we're not only defending nature as something that is outside of us. We defend nature because there, it's our life. We are part of this nature. And we defend our dignity, therefore. So the defense of territory, in a way, encompasses all of these elements. Um, and it's a very interesting language that needs to be acknowledged because sometimes we also, Latin Americans, we fail in a way and we ended up reproducing the concept that I've been using in the West. That doesn't work in this case, because I, if I could say environmental activism, I would do that only to fit with the Western language. But here we're talking about the defense of territories, because that's what people are saying. Um, and it's also interesting that this move from sacrifice zones to resistance zones, because in a way all these activists 
people, local organizers, they say we refuse to be sacrificed. We refuse to be part of this territory that is uh, pretty much um, it's been surrendered, it's been um, given to the to 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 the industries to to die. We refuse to die, so we resist. So we are talking about resistance zones rather than sacrifice zones. Um, and that's very interesting because from there, they, then they say, well, actually, we are, we are, um, we hope that we could get territorial sovereignty. And this is a concept that is very common. I was reading about this. It's just like Tony Negri. I don't know if you, if you are familiar with sociology and politics. And it's like so, this idea of sovereignty coming uh, from from local activists. It's a big shift as well in the language that they'll be using because, and, and the idea that they are embracing here because here they are, they are embracing the idea of self-determination and autonomy uh, and that's also something that in a way moves beyond like some of the frame, frameworks of social movements studies. Um, so, and these are just some few, and the most important, I think, features I have identified of these politics of creation and hope. Um, what are the, well, more traditionally social movements, as scholars would call it, like the repertoires of action, um, knowledge building and dissemination, a very important thing. Let's be in the media, of course, we are in a digital, digital time, so let's be in the, in the media, let's be in social media, but also let's go and, and be in the streets as well. And we go to the markets and, and talk to people and explain them what's going on in our cities. And direct action and protest as well, it's a very common strategy in Chile at least. And, Legal and institutional battles as well, and I think it's very important to mention because it's it's very key of the movements, but it's not the most important one. So that's why it's in the middle of all of these other kind of more grassroots type of uh, of strategies. Um, so legal and institutional battles going through the environmental system in order to present, for example, in Chile we have this called a citizens' participation, so the cities, the, the citizens can go and say something about a project. But that type of participation doesn't mean that they are going to change anything. You're only you're, you're allowed to, to to say what's going on, how you feel about it, but that doesn't mean that they are going to take that into consideration for changes. Um, popular education and community art. So you have all these movements um, usually doing uh, in their same cities doing artwork, music, bringing music, bringing, bringing theater, um, graph, uh, art in the, in the walls, and also developing workshops of popular education, learning about the, what's going on in, in their cities. It's that something very common in the, in the groups as well, that they say we have no idea about these old technical concepts, about to explain, to understand what a gas terminal means, what they're going to do in our territory, for example. And we have to start studying. And we don't have the... Some of them, they don't even have a, a higher education studies. So they only have the secondary studies. They just start studying. And of course, doing a kind of networking with some people from the university, scholars uh, which, uh, who can help. But that's also a very interesting process of knowledge building from the grassroots, not necessarily from the top down. Um, and at the level of uh, the internal dynamics of these movements, uh, it's interesting, and this is also uh, uh, relates, I think, relates very well with this change in politics, um, social movements politics, that has to do with uh, horizontality and assembly-based uh, politics, which I had the chance to mention <coughs> at the, some people from Extinction Rebellion, a couple of weeks ago, and they were very much saying the same. So they were talking about this idea of horizontality and, and of um, uh, at the role of the assemblies. I think they have a name for like citizens assemblies or something like that. Um, so the same. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Latin America, I would say it comes uh, from it, there is a they, they join this international wave of. of politics from since Seattle 
in, in the late 90s, since the Occupy, but, but way before as well, because they follow the indigenous traditions of assemblies. So indigenous communities, they've been doing assemblies since centuries ago. So that's also something that's been taken uh, from this group, by these groups. And the idea of affective politics, which is um, an invitation to change the internal dynamics of the movements. And like, we are not only comrades, you know, political comrades, political associates or whatever. We are friends, we are compañeros in Spanish. So we, we look after each other, we love each other. We want to build different relationships with each other. Um, and all of these, of course, connected to the idea of solidarity and political networks, which is very important. So pretty much all the four cases that I've been working with, they have connections with each other. So they are in touch and they join, um, for example, if there is a local struggle and they have an important, like, more like um, outreach activity, then they, all the other groups will go and will support. So there is a, a dynamic there of solidarity. And just to go to the last part of my presentation, um, so, alternatives to the bad development, so that's another concept that I took bor I borrowed from Ms. Vampa, this Argentinian scholar. What, so, what are the alternatives there? What, what, are, we, uh, what are these groups <coughs> envisioning? Um, and that's where the concept of when we build, um, comes here. Because um, for, for those who are not uh, aware of uh, or don't, don't, haven't heard of the concept of when we build, uh, the translation, roughly translation of uh, when we build, uh, is living well, good living, okay? And it's not only, it doesn't come only from one part, from one uh, um, indigenous dialect. So that's what I put here. So, the sumac kausai quechua, the sumac amanya aymara, the kume mongen mapuche, incluso, even, sorry, even le kilkush le hal, Mexico. So we, uh, the idea of convivir is usually been uh, kind of a, uh, connected or has been understood as something coming from South America, but in the case of Mexico, still there is a word that pretty much means the same. This idea of, so that's why it's a plural category, there is no one single definition, that it includes multiple Latin American indigenous knowledges and cosmologies. But there is one thing that is common here, is the idea that, well here development, the concept of development doesn't exist. So, because like in Amer indigenous dialects don't have a word to translate development because development doesn't exist in their understandings of the world. That's why we realize that it's a very modern concept coming from the West. Um, but what, they, what this idea of living well, um, when we live, uh, has in common with, among all these different, um, I would say, logics, rational, I don't know, uh, knowledges is that there should be an interdependence and harmonic relationship between humans and nature, and how how um, what what's the um, the impact of this idea, which seems very simple. Okay, coexistence, harmonic coexistence between nature and humans. Um, it's very powerful because it entails a strong critique of modernity, of European modernity. Western modernity, uh, the idea of development, the idea of progress, the idea of economic growth, the idea of material consumption, even the idea of sustainable development has been challenged because it's like, okay, can the development be sustainable? Can, can, can we have a society that is sustainable if we don't challenge the idea of uh, unending growth, economic growth? If we have resources, if we have natural commons, because that's another change in the language, people don't talk about natural resources. It's a kind of again, like a, it's like as if it's a resource to be used, to be appropriate, to be explo exploited. This is like these are commons, hmm? natural commons, and we have them for of course for survive for survival, but it's for all of us. So um, they, this idea of when we live. It's very strong in that way, and, and, and the idea that the challenging as well the understanding from the West that nature can be appropriated, can be manipulated. Um, because the idea of when we wish, uh, acknowledges that we are part of the nature. We can't be detached from it. Mm? That's, um, again, it's part of the Cartesian dichotomy, so nature, uh, human <coughs> beings, men, 
more than human beings. Um, but how is that? Of, so the idea of one baby is very much um, seen in indigenous communities, uh, mostly in the countryside, because these indigenous communities that have maintained their ways of living, most of them still live in the countryside, so they, of this, uh, outside of the cities. But how can we imagine then this idea of one baby in the cities? And this is something that is, uh, I think, new, and if we talk in uh, academic terms, I will say it, it, seeks, it seeks to fill a gap, you know, they're talking about, oh, let's fill a gap, okay, this is a gap that needs to be filled. <laughs> uh, what's going on with the idea of when we be in the cities? It's very urban areas where there is not much land available, uh, and we are completely subsumed under the logics of the cities. You know, big shopping centers, lots of trans public transportation, um, issues, um, lots of housing uh, projects coming up, um, big chains of it's all level consumption in Chile. That's pretty much the, the subjectivity more dominant. Um, so then, how do we put and imagine this idea of a in cities like this? Um, so I, from what I've been researching so far. There is a growing interest in Mapuche cosmologies and practices. Mapuche is like the indigenous um, peoples from Chile, but also from Argentina. Um, they call the, they reclaim and uh, uh, their own nation. It's a very complicated issue as well. They don't really see themselves as Chileans or Argentinians. They defend the one Mapu, that's the name they use. Um, and, and also another way, interesting way that I can in a way reflect and understand how they are, in, are taking this idea of what we need in this, into the cities. It's this idea of moving towards a more prefigurative approach in politics. Uh, so um, changing changing things right here, right now, not waiting for a state to take over and to make changes in the future. So embracing the change you want to lead, basically. And that means making changes in your everyday life. Um, so alliances with food co-ops and local producers. So more, it's very interesting that, for example, now there are some new food co-ops and envir so-called environmental activists. That, uh, um, these activists belonging to the other movements. They are joining the food co-ops as well. So it's like it's not only about resisting a project, but it's also how can we live differently. Um, the, the practice of recycling clothes and food. I don't know how to phrase this in English, but it's pretty much going to the markets and take the food that is left there. Okay, so it's not only like the waste that what you do do with your waste. It's just going to the markets and take. So there are a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables there that they just go to the garbage. So just take these and they cook uh, community kitchens uh, and so on. Uh, also changes in eating habits, this is something that is getting uh, growing as well, like doing this transition towards vegetarianism or uh, veganism, uh, eating local and seasonal food as well, choosing local producers and shops, escaping from this, this kind of big um, supermarket chains and, and trying to uh, buy to the local uh, shops. And this other idea, the, I take uh, also more this idea of Chasquintu, that's a word in Mapuche, in Mapuche dialect, um, which is the idea of the, of the interchange, of exchanging, of exchanging goods, exchanging uh, food, exchanging everything really you can exchange. So in a way to move, move away from the, from the um, uh, capitalist economy. So it kind of imagining, and not only imagining, putting into practice these, these different ideas of economies. So exchanges and sharing of Seeds. So that's the main idea of Trafkintu, it's like indigenous communities getting together <coughs> and exchanging their seeds so they can uh, have different veggies and fruits and, and so they, they share it, which is a big, big struggle right now with all the seed uh, patenting process. Monsanto, Bayer, these big companies trying to uh, prevent people from having, keeping their own native seeds. Um, exchanging and sharing of food, of, but also of services, knowledges and skills. So I do, I'm a, I don't know, holistic counselor, so I share my skills with you, which uh, you can uh, fix my roof. So we do, and, and, that me, and that is very interesting because the money is not about, uh, okay, because I have a degree, 
then I my 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 time is more valuable. You know that I don't have a degree, but my, my dad taught me how to fix the roof. You know, so it's another understanding also of time. Um, this so just this is my last slide. Sorry, it's taking a bit long. Um, I think it's important. Doing, practicing when we live in the cities has nothing to do with the when we live that are being, it's been practiced for centuries in the countryside by indigenous communities. Um, it, it's not happening in the countryside, we don't have land, we, have, we are far distant from the, our indigenous roots, but there is an attempt to, to develop all these changes at a very micro level. So these are, uh, we call it, it's not like less spectacular struggles. These are not like the big movements of Latin America, such as the Brazilian peasants or Zapatistas in Mexico. It's not that, that scale, it's a micro scale, but it's still challenging the capitalist logic of living, of, of being in this world. Therefore, when we live in the cities, uh, it's an under construction idea, it's an under construction experience as well, uh, seeking an alternative, uh, an alternative to development, not an alternative development, because development is not what, what these movements are envisioning. It's an alternative to development, an alternative of being and acting in the world that is still under construction. I hope it's, I am explaining myself clearly. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have a bit of time for questions and comments. Merit. Yeah. Thank you, that was really, really interesting. Um, thanks so much for sharing all of this. And I have a question um, about what well, it kind of relates to the last point you made about um, to what extent is it possible to implement when we are in cities and or to what extent are people actually trapped in the ways of living, in the kind of capitalist ways of living because you know, kind of the city context actually leaves little alternative, I think, to most people um, than to live like that. And so um, I'm really the theorist working actually on the role of democracy in, in changing that. So I was really interested what you said about the horizontal governance and, um, and assemblies. Um, so the question's kind of two parts. So I was interested in the extent to which those assemblies work because you're talking about small collectives which which must be fairly homogeneous in terms of people want to pursue the same thing so they're kind of strategic and then maybe the assemblies you know could you say a bit more about um you know how they work um how, how do people meet what kinds of things are discussed but i was really interested in also like are they a model for that could work at the larger scale i know that it's part of um like a society strategy of women. The glass and the door. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, sorry. No, no, I was interested in whether this assembly model of governance does it only work within a small collective or it does it have an ambition to be the model for a different society? And so that's a kind of similar question to can the when we live that comes from indigenous communities, um, is is there like a big societal vision that could work at that different scale? Yeah, sure. No? We'll answer that one first, then we'll have other. Yeah, well thank you very much for your questions. Very interesting. Um, yeah, well, definitely there is this big contradiction, contradiction, and that's what I wanted to just like I put this at the end of the final remarks. Like, okay, is it really possible? Uh, the um, the models that uh, many of these movements are looking at are, mo are models that are happening uh, happening in the countryside. Mm -hmm. So of course the dynamics are completely different. I, I remember very, I did my, my PhD in Mexico, about Mexico and Chile, and I remember very much in Mexico saying, uh, well, the, if we have problems in, within the people of, the, of our community, uh, we live there. We need to figure it out, because that's our land, that's where we live. In the cities, if you have a problem, if you have a group, political group, and you have an issue with someone, you just go away. You don't need to go back there, you don't have a, like, a, a route there. So it's um, 
it's very interesting because the movements have slowly moving towards this idea of, of because because the, the I will say the enemy is so powerful and big the pro these corporate projects that many many activists they are so uh, drained by resisting you know it's because they need to stop the projects as well because they are gonna that those friends are gonna uh, jeopardize the, their families' lives so it's okay we need to stop it. Uh, but but we continue eating in McDonald's and we continue uh, being sucked in this in the logics of, of capitalism, phrasing in, uh, in a way. So it's been a very interesting slow process of realization that the work needs to be needs to be done at these two levels, and, and that's super super difficult and super. Uh, Tiring. What I've been seeing in my region is that several of these activists they are joining food calls at the same time. But imagine what it is to be being part of multiple activist groups. So basically, you don't have a life apart from kind of being involved in politics. Um, so it's way more difficult, I would say. Um, and in terms of the of the assemblies. Um, so these groups are, there are different experiences. The experience of Quintero, this uh, city at more central Chile, it's very interesting because last year, there, uh, because of this crisis, this pollution crisis, the, the people just gather spontaneously in a, in a square. They just went there, they, saw all, they had all their kids at the hospital, and they said, this is it. They are killing us, they are poisoning us, just name it. We need to stop being. Oh no, this is not. This is not the industries there. No, they are not doing. It's fine. No, that was the because many of them work there. So that was like a very, very, very interesting. Yeah, to looking at politically, they just gathered there. Uh, women, fishermen, students, like people from different backgrounds, and they just go to the square and took over the square and just say we're not moving from here until we we need uh, we get an answer from the government. And all these dynamics of horizontality and assemblies, they were developed there for a period of uh, three weeks, more or less, the, the past the period, three weeks, one month, the, the, the period that, that was more kind of uh, strongly organized, the communities. And then after that, these uh, groups emerged. So that was the moment where it started. And then groups, uh, because some people then went back home. So it, it's, like, it's all about movements as well, that's the dynamics of movements. Um, and some groups remain, and then, but they, they maintain this law, this dynamic of uh, calling to uh, big assemblies. Uh, but there is as a core group that makes the effort of bringing these people together. So that's pretty much what's happened in the other groups as well. So they are like they are they of course share more affinity, political affinity. So they are like convinced to want that they want to devote their life to activism. They don't have it's like 20 24 7 type of activism so every single day there's something to do and, and but a part of this um, a very important part of their activism is to call for this uh, kind of uh, city assemblies where they can share information decide on actions and that is and the horizontal dynamic that happens at the micro level also happens at the assembly so it's not that because we are the main the core activists so that when we're going to decide what's going to happen so then it's like well okay so we are willing to share the, this power how to imagine that broader like um uh, i don't think i would love to but i don't think that there is a clarity about um, imagining this as a broader model mm -hmm. um, I think there we enter like into the reign of the utopia, you know, it's like uh, how, how we imagine democracies. Uh, but what is very interesting is that the refusal is clear. The refusal is uh, we reject representative democracy. We are clear about that. Mm -hmm. we, we, we enact this alternative democracy at the local level. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, if I can venture to say, to, to, to give a theory about it or hypothesis about it, I think. There is no understanding of, of changing things at the level of nation state. It's like more like uh, okay, so we let, let, let's work locally. Let's multiply, you know, the the local resistances. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
question. Um, so, what do you think about the fact that the Prime Minister uh, what do you think in terms of legitimacy then? Are there any, do you think that these groups, these movements then, that the, the, the core that drives them, do you think they are really representative or do you think within communities there's going to be divisions and some people who maybe are not represented as a kind of model, political model going forward? Um, do you see that there's problems to do with that and how, how do they address that sort of black representation within communities? So, um, I think that happens a lot in Chile. I don't know if that's a strategy, that's an international strategy with, um, with regards to the companies, for example. It's that uh, under this idea of corporate responsibility, um, companies uh, give money to the, to the local, um, what's the word? Junta de vecinos, like neighborhood councils, yeah, neighbors councils. Um, they give money to the to the leaders of neighbors councils, or they give benefits like some. Okay, we're gonna build like a, a sports facilities in in here, um, and there is a um, like an exchange there. So I give you this, and you support me, or you don't go and not you don't go to the demonstration. That's a, that's, I didn't put it here, it's in my actually findings because that's an entire kind of different topic about the strategies of the state and of the of corporate sector to um, cult, you know, and keep like their the communities. So that's a big division in terms of the communities because there are those who uh, are still defending the companies because of these material uh, goods that they get. And there are those who are very much in line with the with the these grassroots movements and and are supporting them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very also important to mention that uh, many of these uh, activists, uh, I would say half of them, more than half of them, are students. So they, because in Chile we have well a private education system, but that changed slowly. Well, it, there was a change. I don't know. If, yeah, there was a change in 2011 after the big uh, student uh, demonstration, student movement. So it's it's more democratic to get access to the university. So that doesn't mean that the people who are there are like uh, because that's also you can see that in other movements like the uh, more kind of up, upper class student going to the disadvantaged community to do work there. In this case, these are students who are going to the university, but they live in the city and their families, they don't usually don't have studies and so it's very much, when we say grassroots, it's very much grassroots in that, in that sense. Um, and, and I don't think, um, how can I say, and I think also think that is important when I was saying that the institutional battles, they do, even if they don't believe in the state, they go through the legal, pro the institutional processes, it's because they want to get that legitimacy from the community. Because people, for example, older people, they will say, well, if these are only doing direct action, they are, we don't want that, we don't want people going to the uh, barricadas. Yeah. Uh, so therefore they do like, okay, they, usually um, uh, these groups, they don't engage in, in like um, direct action. I think, I don't know if, they, if I use correctly the word direct action, because they are they mostly uh, doing like, non-violent strategies of resistance. Um, and that's a way that they, and going to the institutional path is a way to say, well, we want to get the community on our side. So it's a very slow process, but people, um, I don't think there is research done in that, in that way to say, okay, how much legitimacy there is about these groups. Um, but if you tell, like, at least what I can tell, like, from a qualitative angle, um, there, there are these people, the people aligned with the, companies and the benefits that they get from the companies and from some local city councils, they, they of course they don't accept these groups. But most of the other people they say, well it's good that the young people are fighting for our cities and for our territories. That's pretty much what you can tell from a random citizen passing by. <coughs> other questions? I don't Brian I don't Brian can hear everything. He's on Skype. If he's got any questions? 
Oh. Oh. Yeah, we can. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I just want to say, well, say thanks to Candy as well for, uh, for such an interesting paper. Um, what struck me um, is so much of that discourse was familiar to me from um, a study I did at Friends of the Earth International, um, where there was um, uh, several years really of political conflict. Uh, between northern and southern perspectives on environmentalism and very much that articulation um, uh, you represented it, Katia, of, um, of Latin American um, environmental but not environmental discourse was, was characteristic of the Friends of the Earth groups from Latin America. Um, I guess one thing that came up in those kind of internal debates in Friends of the Earth, which again was partly touched on by your response, uh, by Mara's question and your response to it was um, was just was I suppose the extent to which um, to which um, and you you've already really talked about this in your talk um, but when the Latin Americans were saying in response say to the Europeans well we've already got a kind of indigenous environmentalism um, and we're already um, for example they would much more, much rather talk about resisting neoliberalism than environmental justice. Um, but the, the challenge, I think, was always um, in, um, in that saying, I, I think, to what extent is that culture being nurtured through resistance? I mean, is it, is it in your reading, in its contemporary form as you've described it, with all the variations between city and countryside, is it is, is when we hear and the development of alternatives and hope? Is it something that's essentially fostered through these resistance struggles? Or is it, do you think, primarily something that's already strong in, in various cultures with, in, in Latin America? Because I could never quite tell to what extent it depends on, a, on the development of alternatives through, through the practice of resistance, or whether it's drawing on an indigenous culture and protecting it through resistance. If that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Um... Yeah, well, when you talk about practices and resistance, you are talking about like more international waves of uh, uh, of protest. No, no, I think I meant in the in the form of the community struggles that you described. You know, which is so characteristic of, of environmentalism in, in many countries in, in, in the south. Yeah, well, I think it's a bit of both. That would be my 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 answer to that. Um, I think uh, it's very important to to give a um, like an historical context to to the whatever you are studying really. But in these cases, um, I think it's super important to to acknowledge that it doesn't this doesn't come out of anything. It doesn't come out of the justice climate justice movements at all. Um, uh, it's. Um, with, in Chile, we have a strong culture of resistance. For example, if you look at this, uh, some of the cities have been working. They they've been characterized by um, fighting the dictators, for example. So there is a there is also like a, a culture of of, of, of of resistance at that level. Um, but also there is this, uh, and that's at the cities. But also what what you were saying at the end, um, the. Mapuche resistance. We, I mean, colonial, col uh, the colonial strategies we did great in separating us from our indigenous roots. So we, if we are asked who we are, oh no, we are Chilean. No, I'm not, not indigenous. Of course, I have indigenous roots. It's just like I have, look at me, you know, and just. Um, but there's been like this very, very well done work of of, of kind of this shame towards the uh, feeling. In acknowledging our indigenous roots, and and I think this has changed in the last decade or so, the last decades, and it's getting. Uh, there's so many people now wanting to learn Mapudungun, which is the Mapuche dialect now in in Chile. Um, so now there is this recovery of um, of this ancient culture and if it's and of its political practices and. And of the, and not only the indigenous, uh, Brian, right? That's, that's yeah. Brian. It's also about like the, the popular, um, the 
what is we call in English disadvantaged communities, you know, there is no a translation with that in Spanish as well. Las uh, sectores populares, popular sectors, people, so we will say in, in Chile, um, is this is, is this um, a kind of history of of survival, which I think, and of community that people are trying to keep. So it's not only new, so there is a intent of recovering the old, but it's also an engagement with something that is new. Maybe not that new when we're talking about horizontality, for example, when we're talking about assemblies. Okay, is that really new? So if we're talking that, uh, that indigenous communities were running assemblies centuries ago, so uh, maybe it's new in comparison to the logics of, the, of representative democracy that, that, that been clear uh, dominant, dominating the politics in the last uh, century. I don't know if it makes sense, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah just, can, can I just add a, um, a, a brief comment? It just um, what, that, what this sort of brings home to me, I think, it, what became clear, say, within Friends of the Earth during their debates is that um, in some senses when you have these debates, we, we kind of look for a model that can be generalised or can be globalised in some way. And of course, I think, and, and probably that's what the Europeans were looking for when they were in dialogue with other regions in Friends of the Earth. But, but what was sort of interesting is that the big argument was between the Latin Americans and the Europeans. And then there was, there was also an African region and an Asia Pacific region. And so when they were discussing the attempt to phrase, for instance, a kind of um, an economic programme that was an alternative, that the Europeans and the Latins couldn't agree on a terminology, so they came up with the acronym EJRN, and EJRN stood for Economic Justice Resisting Neoliberalism. But when the, then the groups from Asia Pacific and Africa said, although they have loads in common in terms of understanding, you know, obviously in terms of a history of colonialism, but also a, a range of other strategic commonalities with the Latin Americans, they didn't adopt the terminology of uh, resisting neoliberalism and they had their own ways of kind of phrasing based on their own, you know, um, both cultural traditions, experience of resistance and mobilisation. And I think what that really showed in the end was kind of what you were saying, Katia, which, which is that it, it's always a mix of these kind of um, multiple sources and multiple experiences. Um, I'll stop there, otherwise I'm talking too much. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, uh, really interesting, thanks. But what really piqued my interest was when you started talking about um, indigenous indigenous illnesses. I guess I kind of missed I probably missed it in your presentation about how how the indigenous senses actually fit into uh, I guess kind of echoing um, Brian's comments, how it fits into like what you were talking about initially, um, like about the formation of um, these these movements, these um, environmental justice movements. Um, like for me, I think it is you know quite interesting, kind of bringing up that to the forefront as well. Um, like in terms of what the indigenous learnings are, but well, at least for me, that that's like the most you know that's the interesting part in terms of trying to. Uh, kind of suggest um, alternatives to development. Um, but on a side note as well, there is, you know, there is a large, well, there is like an increasing amount of literature that, that connects um, indigenous lenses with, say, for example, sustainable development goals, like linking the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous, the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples with that of the SDGs. Um, which kind of, you know, tries to put in, you know, what is the indigenous kind of view, um, like indigenous populations views on, on sustainable development. Yeah, well, just a word on, on last uh, comment of Brian. Uh, I think that that's why, uh, in my case, in my work, I don't, I don't engage with the, with kind of more like more mainstream, I don't know, I know that word, is, they said, not use that word, but, Anyway, with more mainstream approaches to social movements, like more like the identity, uh, more approaches, cultural approaches from Europe, or like the resource mobilization approaches from the US, uh, because I don't think they can explain this new, not new, but this 
uh, very particular and peculiar forms of organizations and in a way that I, I really uh, try to position myself uh, and to bring to the north as well and to the west that when I'm here speaking in English like I think it's this is such an important exchange you know to, 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 to share what's going on there and to also challenge the concepts and the terminology and the frameworks and just and to claim that that there are frameworks being produced in Latin America, and that those uh, there can be a source of also of uh, that can be useful for the for what it's being studied in, or somewhere else in the in the world. That's like I would say uh, it's a for me it's a very important uh, uh, principle and mission in my work. Um, and in terms of, um, of what what you are saying, uh, I think uh, because it's so kind of. Big the issue, the topic, and the, the indigenous struggle, the Mapuche struggle by itself, it's such a big thing and complicated uh, topic. I didn't get into details in my presentation, but what I could say is that one of the most important movements, that long lasting movements of resistance in Chile, is the Mapuche, so these indigenous peoples. So people uh, in, somehow uh, engage with the uh, um, anti-capitalist politics, uh, um, not necessarily anti-capitalist, also all these kind of uh, type of alternative type of politics, they, they see with admiration what the, the resistance of indigenous people. So um, the connection is there and it's historical because this is happening for decades, but now it's getting, uh, it's getting I think, easier to have this link between indigenous peoples and the city and the and the cities the non-indigenous which we also share groups but uh, so um, there is there is a more com more communication within within the groups mm? so in a way that in a way how they relate about your your the other part of your comment um, <coughs> that's a problematic one actually because um, the the groups I've been working with, so this is about my case studies, um, which are, I would say, very much the ones which have been doing more resistance, they've been really in the media and so on, they, they don't engage with, this, with this institutional politics, um, and they actually now there, there is a, you know, there is this climate um, change conference happening in Chile now in December, um, they are not participating on it. Well, they haven't been invited, but the, all the movements are organizing their alternative uh, gathering all from communities from all the country, and they are just like, um, in a way, the, 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 the challenges, so the UN uh, and the goal, the Sustainable Development Goals, how can they, do they, do they address structures of oppression? Do they say this is happening because of capitalism, because of colonialism, because of patriarchy? Um, where do these inequalities come from? Um, can they? Can these goals be? Um, they are not enforced by the, to the government. So basically, it's like a it's good good willingness, you know, so good intentions to be applied uh, to apply these goals in, in the countries. So. Um, there is a critique of the, of this being a bit naive, you know, of this idea of this kind of like more institutional, transnational frameworks coming from the case of the UN uh, being a bit naive. And and the biggest part, and the one you mentioned about the indigenous, is that um, the the regulations you mentioned, like the I just say it in, in Spanish, OIT, it's like uh, O I T, you know. Okay, um, so the respect of indigenous rights, uh, unfortunately that doesn't happen in Chile. So the reality is that indigenous communities are, are being displaced, are being dispossessed, uh, they are being, their lands are being taken over by these projects, so there is no respect for them, for their rights, not even as their indigenous rights. So the frameworks that are supposed to prevent this to happen, they don't happen in practice. So basically, when you see that, then you can understand why these people are so annoying and they just don't believe in the institutional framework. So uh, it happens very well at, a, at, the, at the level of the discourse, but at the level of the practice, um, it gets a bit problematic. I don't know if you... I, I, I definitely agree. Um, I've just come back from doing fieldwork as well. I've been looking at um, Australian indigenous communities um, and how they're 
And I think in the case of Chile, there is not even like this, uh, because in the case, I don't know if it's of Australia is that a case, but in the case of having like this segregate, like these places, special places for indigenous, I don't know the word. Yeah, that doesn't. I think that's kind of like, like a thing that happens in Canada and in the US as well. And in the case of Mabuche, they say, they don't even want that. They say, well, we want to be recognized as a nation state. So we have our own stuff here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's very it's, radical, a very radical. It's happening in a few places in Australia as well, and they're getting very suffering. Hi, I'm Jason. Uh, I'm Jason. I'm from Australia. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any sort of like
so-called environmental struggles uh, or struggles in defense of territories, to be more accurate to the accurate to the to the language they are using. Um, so I would say in the last decade there has been a change because you you described it very well at the beginning, you said like, is there a change in this logic of kind of action reaction, you know, like this idea of like, so a project, so there is, there is a project coming here, so we resist and we react to this project. Um, I will say that in the last three, four years, there is there has been this shift towards the past in the way of kind of this idea of prefiguration. I use, I kind of engage with this idea of prefiguration, of prefigurative politics, of saying, well, okay, so we need to resist because we are this. We're talking about our lives, our lives, but it's not enough with resisting. So we need to embrace different ways of living, and I think that's something that is that has changed among the young people. And I think that's a very important thing to to clarify because young people they are much more subsumed into the logic of neoliberalism because like you have all the shops and you have all this lifestyle. But not necessarily their parents or their grandparents, because their grandparents are fishing, their grandparents are going to the to the forest to collect uh, you say like mushroom, I don't know, yeah. native ones. So they are still like keeping these old practices. But I think the 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 young people were in a way so, uh, absorbing within the system, but trying to do resistance and contentious politics. And now it, there is been this shift towards so. That's not enough. So let's do this. Let's resist because we're talking about our lives. But not that's not enough. We also um, create, prefigurate the worlds we want to live in. They, I will leave it there. And about what um, you are asking. Um, so I don't do work. As if to be like very academic, I don't do work about how politicians' uh, views and perceptions have changed. Um, and my focus is on movements, pretty much. Uh, what so, what is the perspective? so a personal perspective, I don't think they care too much about. Uh, I think there is a, um, um, uh, well, yeah, no, I rephrase. I think they they have realized because of course there are so many conflicts, and now, for example, like people uh, analyzing social movements in Chile say the main movements in Chile are the students the Mapuche feminist, and even more in this uh, scale, the environmental ones. So <coughs> those are the main issues happening, going on in Chile. And right now, I would say Mapuche and environmentalists are like the key ones. Therefore, there are strategies of control and cooptation in place. And also, like the strategies, like the state strategies are uh, very clear, so they, uh, Send people to jail. Start. They go to the suit. 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 They give a like lawsuit. Uh, what's the word? Yeah. Uh, to activists uh, and and they invite people to discuss about environmental issues as what it's being planned now for December. But only the leaders that are docile, you know, only those who are not challenging very much. So that's my perspective about it, from what I can see right now. But I, yeah. And about your, your other question, I haven't heard about that, uh, the, the concept you mentioned, but I've heard of the growth, and that's, also, that's a network that's international actually, and some people are talking about uh, the growth, the crecimiento in Spanish in Chile. And but most more than that about solidarity economies. That's the concept being used uh, more in Chile. And this idea of solidarity economies is very much tied with the idea of one we build. So that's like a. But it's a nice uh, and that's a Latin American mostly I think idea. But when you look at the the basis, the, the ideas behind it, they are so common. I mean, they they grow with the uh, solidarity economies and even the idea of one we so there is a common root there, so there's, there are many things in common. Um, and I think people are, uh, as I said, I think it's very interesting. Well, I'm part, when I do engage research, participatory action research, I'm part of the food co-op, for example, that I was mentioning. And this is something that is growing a lot in, in Chile, like 
let, let's engage also with cooperativism as an idea that we can develop from the grassroots and, and to, to imagine and to actually put into practice new ways of thinking. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank it you. Was, uh, that was very nice. Been fascinating as well. I think getting the view and this idea. I think about the uh, the, the, view, the southern views and looking at indigenous views as well. I think within our cusp program as well, we're really recognising that it actually you know something we uh, look at the diversity of environmentalisms around the world. Uh, something we'll be wanting to look at more in the future as well. But it also makes us look at what's happening here on the ground in Britain in a different way from your experience as well. You've given us some new tools and new. Ways of looking, so thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Very thank you for the invitation, for the trust. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you all.